Hi, everybody. Uh, in this video, I'm going to continue talking about the digestive system. So far, you've learned about um, some of the accessory organs that, of course, are important to the process of digestion, but they're not actually interacting with the food. So they're not literally part of the elementary canal. Um, so today we're going to start uh, pretty much in the mouth and then work all the way down, um, hopefully through the small intestine. Before we do, however, uh, let's just uh, talk about or I will walk through a couple questions for you, um, which is not a function of the liver. So I'll just point out which ones are. And then of course, one is not. Um, they produce blood clotting proteins, right? Absolutely. We know about this from the first lecture exam. These blood clotting proteins um, are those um, clotting factors that are circulating around the blood. Part of your exam was to uh, talk about blocking one of those clotting proteins and what would happen um, to the entire process of co coagulation. Um, so that one is a function of the liver. Um, eliminate, oops, sorry, um, eliminate a byproduct of breaking down red blood cells. Well, this is uh, the bilirubin. Uh, produce emulsifying agents to facilitate the breakdown of lipids. Absolutely. And we're actually going to be talking a lot more about that later in this talk. Um, detoxify ingested substances such as alcohol. Again, this is absolutely a function of the liver. And finally, uh, hopefully this one is incorrect, um, and it is, uh, produce enzymes to digest all biomolecules. That one is not a function of the liver. The liver is not producing digestive enzymes. Instead, um, this, um, this answer is actually referring to the pancreas. Okay, so E would be the correct slash incorrect answer. Uh, which of the following processes will occur in your hepatocytes? to maintain adequate blood sugar between lunch and dinner. So the thought here is that um, you aren't starving, right? It might feel like you're super hungry, but you're not actually starving. And so there's no need to make new glucose, okay? You're pretty much just breaking down some of that storage, um, some of those storage molecules, okay? So let's just walk through these different parts here or these different options. Glycogenesis, this is generating glycogen. Okay, generating glycogen. Glycogen happens to be that storage molecule. So we don't want to be storing any extra sugar that we have in between meals. Instead, we want to be breaking that down. Okay, so A is not correct. This is what happens um, right after you eat a meal. Okay, gluconeogenesis, right? Generating new glucose. Okay, so um, Again, we do not want to be making new glucose. We're not starving at this point. Instead, we want to break down that storage molecule, which we know is glycogen. Okay, so glycogenolysis, lysis is breakdown of glycogen. Okay, so that is the one that we want C is the correct answer. And so I showed you this in a previous um, lesson. And so let me just point out that um, we eat glucose, right? Glucose is either used immediately in cell respiration, okay? So here we see glycolysis, which is the anaerobic process within your cells. Um, it's converted into pyruvate. And then ultimately pyruvate is used by the mitochondria to generate a lot of ATP from just a single glucose molecule, okay? If we don't absolutely need that glucose, or rate this for a minute, um, we, um, store it, right? So here we generate glycogen, right? So glucose is tacked onto glycogen and then it is stored until we need it next, okay? Um, finally, if we um, do need to break down a little bit of the storage molecule because we haven't eaten in a couple hours, um, but our cells are still burning through glucose, then we use glycogenolysis, lysis, breakdown of the glycogen, Right, so then we can use those new glucose molecules to um, fuel our cells. Okay, and then finally, gluconeogenesis. This is kind of reversing pyruvate, kind of putting it back together to create new glucose. Okay, so again, the correct answer here is glycogenolysis, or yeah, glycogenolysis. Okay, um, okay. Uh, just want to emphasize um, the. Um, positioning of the liver versus the pancreas and all of these different fluids kind of coming together uh, and being secreted into the alimentary canal. So into the gastrointestinal tract itself, this long continuous tube from mouth to anus, that is what holds the food. That is what is digesting the food and processing it. Um, 
the accessory organs, the gallbladder, the liver, the pancreas, all of these are going to um, secrete fluids into that canal, but they're not actually interacting with the food directly. Okay. So the bile duct here is carrying bile from the liver <clears throat> and the pancreas um, is secreting those pancreatic juices. So bicarbonate rich fluid that is filled with enzymes that can digest all four classes of bio molecules. Okay. And I'm going to keep saying that because it's super important. Now, if there is a uh, the development of a gallstone, for example, um, here we see gallstones uh, and the gallbladder has produced them. And instead of just being a problem of the gallbladder and the liver, and of course it's subsequent um, digestive issues. Here, what we see is because the bile duct and the main pancreatic duct come together at this hepatopancreatic ampulla, essentially if a gallstone um, blocks up this junction, because it has been pushed down the bile duct here, it's not only affecting, this, affecting the secretions of the liver and the gallbladder, but also the pancreas as well. And as you can see here, it's kind of funny, but um, uh, in reality, that would be a pretty serious situation. Okay, so um, again, those are the accessory organs. Now let's shift into talking about digestion itself. Um, well, to really boil it down, digestion is just the process of making big molecules into smaller molecules. Okay, so it is um, a process of mechanically, so physically breaking apart big clunky molecules into smaller monomers and also chemically breaking those molecules down. So breaking a big polymer with lots of different um, monomers joined together, breaking them down into individual monomers. Okay. Um, ultimately, we need monomers, right? So not the big old glycogen, but what we need individual glucose molecules, because if we don't break those molecules down to that large of degree, we essentially cannot absorb those molecules into our body. Um, and so uh, we'll talk about this later a little bit, but ultimately um, one of the reasons that um, lactose intolerance can be so uncomfortable um, is because um, essentially individuals who are lactose intolerant don't produce the correct form um, or the active form of an enzyme called lactase. Um, and that leaves molecules virtually undigested, so not in their monomer form. And so lactose can't be absorbed across the intestinal lining and therefore it stays in the intestines and kind of wreaks havoc from there on down. Okay. Um, digestion, both mechanical and chemical digestion, occurs entirely within the, the alimentary canal. So not within those accessory organs, just within the GI tract. Okay. The digestive system, um, of course, is there for digestion. Um, but we can break this function down a lot more. Um, the first, um, first kind of step and the first function of the digestive system is first of all to ingest um, the, the food in the first place. So to actually take it into your mouth, okay, ingesting it into your body. So that is actually a, a function of the digestive system. Once the food has been ingested, um, then you begin the process of mechanical digestion. Um, so essentially the idea here is that um, you take a big bite of hamburger, those molecules in the burger, in the lettuce, in the tomato, in the bun, all the different things that you're eating, um, those molecules um, you know, are big clunky polymers. And the very first thing we want to do is start breaking them down into tiny little pieces for the purpose of increasing the surface area of these, um, of these uh, clumps of food so that enzymes can actually get in there um, in a lot more places. Okay, so mechanical digestion is just increasing the surface area um, that the enzymes can act upon. Okay. Mechanical digestion includes a couple different things. Uh, first of all, mastication is the process of chewing. So the purpose of your teeth really is to get in there and um, just with sheer force, slice those molecules from being really big into being much smaller. Okay. Um, once mastication is complete, then the process of deglutition or 
swallowing is going to occur. And so I'm going to show you this little clip here. Um, and I just want you to note, um, you know, what the tongue is doing. I want you to note what, um, you know, the tongue and the teeth, right, involving uh, mastication, uh, and then the process of swallowing, right? And we're going to see some structures that we've actually uh, talked about before. So the uvula and the soft palate, and we're going to see the epiglottis. And ultimately, once food has been chewed up and kind of mixed together with the saliva, which also contains enzymes, by the way, um, it is going to be propelled to the back of the oral cavity and directed down the esophagus, not down the larynx and trachea. Looks like we don't have any volume here, but that's okay. I can talk you through it. Okay, so what we see is an individual um, first taking a bite, ingesting a bite of the apple here. Okay, note the role of the teeth. Um, what he's doing now is he is chewing these larger molecules and creating what is called a bolus. Okay, um, the bolus is saliva and partially mechanically digested food being mixed together into this kind of clump here. Um, the swallowing reflex is initiated when the tongue instinctively pushes this bolus back to the uh, posterior side of the oral cavity. All right. During the swallow reflex, we see the uvula move up. We see the glottis snap shut because of those false vocal folds. Okay. And the epiglottis is going to swing down over the glottis, the opening into the respiratory system. Okay. So here we can see the epiglottis and here we can see the bolus being directed down the posterior side, okay, and into the esophagus. Note that the sides of the esophagus are actually really muscular and they are completing um, these sequential contractions uh, called peristalsis, and we'll look at that on the next slide, essentially pushing the bolus lower and lower into the stomach through what is called a lower esophageal sphincter, which you might've seen on acid reflux commercials. Um, there is a secondary wave of peristalsis, which essentially um, kind of cleans the walls of the esophagus, um, kind of uh, pushing down any uh, rogue crumbs um, from the bolus. Okay, so that is the swallow reflex. Um, I like that video because you can actually see the contraction of the uvula the epiglottis being pulled down over that larynx. Okay, so the opening into the respiratory system. Um, this is why when you talk, right, and air is coming out here, um, the epiglottis has to be essentially open. Um, and food and drink can be diverted down this pathway into your lungs instead of um, to the posterior tube, which is the esophagus. Okay, um, again, this. Um, these sequential contractions that we see here on the walls of the esophagus, that is called peristalsis. Okay, so, um, this is an action of the smooth muscles within um, the walls of the GI tract, and they're moving the bolus, now we see the word written out for us, um, down the digestive tract. Okay, um, oops. Um, there is another type of contraction that's going to be produced by the muscular layer of the GI tract wall, and that is called segmentation. And so segmentation is where instead of having, you know, this section contract and then this section and then this section essentially pushing the food along, instead there is a mixing component here and right? a mixing function. Um, so I just want to show you that again, and I don't know why there's not um, <laughs> volume here, but essentially um, we see that there's, um, you know, here is peristalsis kind of moving the food along um, the transverse colon actually. Uh, what we can also see is some mixing of the food, right? So down here in the small intestine, we can see that, you know, there's a contraction and contraction, and it's kind of like kneading the food together with those digestive enzymes and other fluid um, that is within the GI tract, right? So we start off with separated clumps of food and ultimately segmentation is mixing those um, substances together and peristalsis is propelling them along. Okay, so just two different, again, functions of the digestive system. Um, 
all the big ones here um, is chemical digestion. Um, chemical digestion is uh, conducted by the use of enzymes. If you remember from AMP1, an enzyme is a protein, right? almost always a protein that is, um, that functions as an organic catalyst. So essentially it's going to take um, some kind of molecule, right? in this case, uh, maybe a glycogen molecule, and it is going to break the bond in between individual glucose molecules. Um, enzymes are specific to whatever, um, whatever substrate um, they are kind of like built for, they kind of match. Um, so they are specific. That is, an enzyme that digests glycogen can't digest nucleic acids. Okay. Um, usually the enzymes are named according to whatever substrate they or reactant um, they are going to work with. Um, and so um, they generally end with the suffix ace. Right? So lactate digests lactose. Okay. Um, cellulose or is digested by cellulase. Okay, so you can see that the matching there, ACE indicates the enzyme, um, and the first part of the word indicates what it's actually digesting. Okay. Um, another important feature of enzymes is that they can catalyze reaction after reaction, and at the end of the reaction, the enzyme is exactly the same as it was in the beginning of the reaction. So they're not actually affected, they're not actually changed by catalyzing the reaction, so they're not actually involved in it, they are just making the reaction proceed more quickly. All right, so you actually get more of the products than you would if you didn't have an enzyme. Okay. Uh, one um, enzymes function best under certain conditions. Okay, this is going to become really important when we walk, walk through the stomach versus the small intestine versus the large intestine. Um, ultimately, these enzymes um, are held together by hydrogen bonds. And when they encounter a different pH, what can happen is they can unravel. Okay. or they can change shape in such a way that they become activated by this particular pH. And so we actually use this in our digestive system all the time to make sure that a certain enzyme, um, for example, digests proteins only in the stomach. And then as soon as it enters the large or the small intestine, all of a sudden that protein is inactive. Okay. It's not able to digest anymore. And so we get this really specific compartmentalization of where different types of molecules are going to be digested because of the changes in pH throughout the digestive system. Okay. Um, another thing, uh, enzymes are also dependent upon temperature. Okay. So when you have um, a really high fever, for example, um, this can be fatal because your enzymes, for example, start to denature, they start to unravel. Okay. And that again is fatal. Um, some enzymes require what are called cofactors or coenzymes. And so these molecules um, are required to bind with the enzyme in order to activate it. And uh, this is in fact one of the, um, one of the benefits of uh, taking your vitamins, right? So there are certain vitamins that um, act as cofactors. So in order to digest a certain thing, in order to catalyze a specific reaction, you need to have these types of cofactors. Um, finally, um, some enzymes or all enzymes can be inhibited. So in order for a reaction to proceed, it needs, the enzymes need to be freely active and not inhibited. Okay. Speaking of activated enzymes. Um, we have kind of touched upon this before at different points. Um, for example, um, when we talked about the process of um, hemostasis, we talked about the coagulation cascade. This activates this, activates this. Okay. Um, ultimately, um, you know, prothrombin is activated into thrombin and only then can thrombin essentially make fibrin. Okay, and then we can form a clot. And so enzymes can be active or inactive. This is really important in the digestive system because um, there are certain types of enzymes that aren't just specific to the foods that we eat. Okay? 
they can also break down our own molecules as well, right? So our human molecules aren't like some super different thing, right? So they're not their own independent entity. And so we don't make enzymes that could actually break down our own cells. Instead, our proteins, for example, are made up of the same amino acids, the same stuff as the food that we're eating. And so if we just start releasing enzymes willy nilly, we can actually break down our own cells, right? And obviously we don't want to digest ourselves. And so the way that we um, approach this problem is that we secrete inactive enzymes for particular types of biomolecules. Specifically, proteins and their amino acids are the building blocks of our cells, of our bodies. And so we really don't want to just randomly release activated proteases, right? Prote, right, for protein, ace for enzymes. So enzymes that specifically digest proteins can be very dangerous. So we only release proteases as what are called zymogens. Okay, so zymogen means an inactive enzyme. And oops, uh, so one example um, is in our uh, small intestines, we release, our pancreas actually, releases an inactive enzyme, a zymogen called trypsinogen, right? The ogen is kind of implying that it's a zymogen. Um, the only way to activate trypsinogen is for trypsinogen to end up in the lumen of the elementary canal, okay? So if, um, you know, if your pancreas leaks into the blood, it's not going to be releasing activated protease, proteases. Instead, the only way to get these activated enzymes is once trypsinogen here is safely in the lumen of the digestive system. Okay. Um, once in the lumen, trypsinogen is activated by enzymes that are only found on the surface of the intestinal lining. And yeah, they're called enterokinases. And essentially they remove this little block um, that's inactivating trypsinogen and it's therefore activated into trypsin. And so this particular enzyme is very um, powerful, not only as a protease, but also it goes forth and it activates all sorts of other zymogens as well. Yeah, so it leads to this um, exponential increase in the digestion of proteins just by activating this single zymogen. Okay, so it goes through and it activates all of these. Now, each, um, well, so you may or may not remember learning this in AP1, but just as a very brief reminder, um, the food we eat and the molecules that make up our bodies um, are all classified into four different biomolecule categories. Okay, we have the carbs, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Each one of these different types of biomolecules is made up of um, a predictable pattern of a carbon backbone. Okay, so lots and lots of carbon with different functional groups attached that gives rise to the different um, uh, chemical behaviors of these molecules. Now, carbohydrates, for example, are, um, you know, have this particular carbon backbone shape. Individual subunits of carbohydrates are collectively called monosaccharides. Okay, so glucose is a monosaccharide. And so when we join multiple monosaccharides together into this long chain, like a glycogen or a cellulose molecule, that is therefore called a polysaccharide. Okay, similarly, joining um, subunits amino acids together to form a, po a polypeptide or a protein. Okay, so this chart, um, if, you've, uh, if you have my class for AP1, this may look very familiar to you. It's the same one that I used then. Um, but even if you haven't, this chart summarizes all four categories and the monomer names and the polymer names. Now, as I mentioned before, the reason this is important is that when we eat food, we're generally eating polymers. Okay, so we are um, eating glycogen in our meat. We are eating cellulose in our salad. Okay, we eat fat right, in our hamburger as well. Right? Lots of protein, um, 
we are eating the components or we are eating cells of other organisms, whether you're eating meat or veggies or whatever, you're always eating cells. Uh, and so those cells contain nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. So we eat these, but our body uses these. Okay, so your hamburger molecules that you're taking in are polymers. They are cow molecules. They are lettuce molecules. We need to break them down via digestion into monomers. Only monomers can be absorbed across our intestinal lining and into our blood. And then our bodies uses our bodies use these monomers to put them together in a different way to form human molecules. Okay, so literally you are what you eat, but in the middle there, um, you have to take big molecules, make them smaller, and then use those smaller molecules and build them up into bigger molecules once again. Okay. Uh, let me show you a brief example here. Um, all right, carbohydrates um, are made up of monosaccharides, the individual subunits. This here is glucose. It has a predictable carbon ring shape. Um, now in the carbohydrates, if we join together two monomers, we call them disaccharides. And the reason that um, disaccharides are important, so two individual monomers linked, is because these are essentially um, the sweeteners. Right? So sucrose and lactose and maltose and fructose, all of those are disaccharides. They are the sweet ones. Okay? Now, if we put tons of these together, um, we can put them together in a plain old chain. Um, and that is kind of the structure of starch, right? Or also called amylose, right? Which would be digested by amylase um, and glycogen. Okay, so we talk about this a lot. Each one of these little circles here represents an individual glucose carbon ring. Um, so this nice branching structure here um, is characteristic of glycogen as opposed to a chain-like structure in starch. Okay. Um, now, the next function I'm going to talk about is secretions. Um, now, the digestive system is going to secrete a lot of different things, so a lot of enzymes. Um, so there are structures within the digestive system whose sole purpose is to um, transcribe, translate, process, and then ultimately excrete different types of proteins, such as enzymes. Okay? Um, the digestive system secretes um, acids, Okay, so especially in the stomach, we see a lot of acid secretion, um, different types of buffers, as we're going to see here soon. The um, stomach is super acidic, but then the small intestine is pretty darn basic. And so we really have to put a lot of effort into buffering anything that's coming out of the stomach so it doesn't burn your intestinal lining. Okay, And finally, the digestive system is actually a powerful series of endocrine organs. Um, you'll see in a couple lessons from now that um, the digestive system produces a slew of different hormones called the enterogastrones that are mostly regulating the digestive system, but they're also regulating other parts of your body. Um, and so um, the digestive system is kind of fascinating in that it very much regulates itself. It has its own completely separate nervous system and its own endocrine system. Um, so really a lot of different control of this very complex system. Finally, um, the once the larger biomolecules, the poly, uh, polymers, have been broken down into monomers, we can finally absorb those molecules. And so when I say absorption, I am talking about um, food particles, these monomers, crossing over the intestinal lining into the body. Okay. Now, if we take a look at this very simplified diagram of the digestive system here, we see that the elementary canal is a single continuous tube. And as long as stuff is inside this tube, it's not really in the body. Okay. It is um, kind of held outside the body. It is separated from our tissues by an epithelial lining. Okay. So um, if we don't actively take those substances, from in the tube across the epithelial lining and dump them into the blood, they essentially are going to go out with the wash. Okay. 
Um, so absorption is taking those biomolecules, it is taking water, okay? it is taking different types of vitamins across the barrier between outside the body, right, in the tube, and inside the body in the blood. Okay. Finally, whatever we don't absorb is ultimately going to, again, go out the wash. Um, and so your colon is going to compact that waste as much as physically possible. And so this involves dehydrating it as much as possible. So pulling a lot of water out of the feces and back into the body. Um, of course, you know, all along the tube, you want um, a lot of mixing, a lot of churning of the food. You want the mixing with digestive enzymes. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so you want a lot of fluid. Also, you want um, the fluid in the food to move through the digestive system pretty easily, right? You don't want to be scratching up the lining of your digestive tract. So you want a lot of fluid up here for the ease of propulsion, but you don't want to let a lot of water back out of your body, okay? That's very inefficient. You'd have to drink a ton if you constantly had very watery stool. And so um, a lot of water is absorbed way down here in the large intestine. And those muscles that we saw a couple slides ago are also working to compact that more solid stool in the large intestine. <clears throat> the final function of the digestive system is defecation. So actually the conscious release of these waste products. Um, and as we're going to see um, in another lesson, um, defecation is controlled both consciously and subconsciously. Uh, so we actually get to choose when it is convenient to defecate. Um, so there's a lot of technology that is involved in that process. And of course, it takes a little while to kind of train um, those structures uh, to, um, you know, relax or contract, right? So that's why you wear diapers for the first couple years of your life. A um, little bit more about this tube. Um, the alimentary canal is a tube just like any other that we've talked about so far this semester. We talked about the three layers in the wall of the airways. We've talked about the three layers in the wall of the heart, in the wall of the blood vessels. And so the digestive system is just another tube. So I'm just gonna fly through this because we already have a strong basis of understanding for these tubes, okay? Um, the, the outermost layer is called the serosa. Um, in the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in the abdominal cavity, we have the third and final type of serous membrane, the serosa, um, and that's called the peritoneum. Um, now in the intestines, we have the peritoneum, wrapping around the outside of the tube and then kind of doubling back on itself, okay? Um, and so what this does is it produces this double layer of peritoneum through which all of these blood vessels, arteries, veins, nerves, and lymphatic vessels are going to route to the tube itself, okay? Now this peritoneum is going to surround um, pretty much all of the organs um, of the digestive system in the abdominal cavity, that is, um, with a few exceptions. Okay, so it doesn't cover the oral cavity or the esophagus, right, because it's not all the way up here. Um, it also doesn't cover the duodenum and the rectum. Okay, so both of these organs, even though they're within the abdominal pelvic cavity, they are considered to be retroperitoneal, so behind the peritoneum. Okay. Instead of being covered by the serous membrane, they are covered by adventitia. Okay. So just another layer of connective tissue around um, the, those particular organs. In this image, we can see um, kind of the same thing one more time. Um, so I just want to point out the outermost layer on the outside of the elementary canal is actually, for the most part, the peritoneum. Um, and because of um, the structure of the intestines, 
peritoneum wraps around the tube, doubles back on itself and forms this double layer of serous membrane. That double layer actually has a name. I mean, go figure, it's anatomy after all. Um, the name of this double layer of peritoneum is called the mesenteries. Um, and as of like two years ago or so, um, the mesenteries are considered to be their own organ, which is kind of swell. Um, but essentially, um, we can see the double membrane right here. When you dissect the cat, you'll also be able to see it. It's rather lovely. Um, so here we can see blood vessels going to and from the intestine. The double layer is on um, this kind of opaque um, membrane. Okay, and so this is essentially holding the intestines in place, right? So every time you do jumping jacks, your intestines don't like tie themselves in a knot. Um, you'll see with the cat that um, the peritoneum kind of holds them roughly organized so that they don't like bunch together. Um, so it's stabilizing the position of the elementary canal. Okay, um, it is a route for these different vessels and nerves. Um, also, there is a portion of this double layer that essentially like hangs off the bottom of the stomach and is filled with fat. Um, and so let me point out this mid-sagittal section right here. We can see the parietal layer of the peritoneum here in red. Okay, so the parietal layer is um, going around the wall, right, up over the bladder, the uterus, the rectum. Okay, um, and then we can see that it extends out into the body cavity and changes color. And so the change in color here is the visceral peritoneum. Right, it wraps around part of the intestine, doubles back. Here's part of the mesentery. It right, wraps around, right? And so another double layer of the membrane. Um, so these here are the mesenteries. But also, um, what I'm getting at here is that this is the stomach. Right? We can see peritoneum on either side. And it kind of hangs down all the way to the front of these organs. And right? it's kind of like um, a little curtain protecting these intestines back here. Um, and so this is what it looks like from the front of this diagram here. Here's the stomach and hanging off the stomach is this, um, what is called lacy curtain, um, which is a translation for greater momentum um, that is filled with fat. And it is um, just sitting right over top of the rest of the intestines. And again, you'll see this when you dissect the cat, um, this, um, Kind of floppy hanging down right over top. Why? <laughs> Why would we need a greater momentum? Um, well, first of all, it protects the intestines, right? From, you know, if you get punched in the gut, no big deal. You not only have um, theoretically some um, subcutaneous fat, right? So um, here is the skin, here is a layer of subcutaneous fat right in the hypodermis and right? so that's kind of protecting your intestines as well but you also have this extra layer of fat on the inside um this is not something you go to the gym and try to get rid of right you need this little bit of padding on the inside um it's a good thing <clears throat> to pad the intestines but also to prevent you from getting um uh to prevent you from having intestinal issues due to a hernia. Okay, so let me take a step back and talk about a hernia a little bit. Um, hernias are where your internal organs are going to protrude through some kind of weakness in your abdominal wall. Now, there are a couple places that um, these hernias, these weaknesses naturally occur, um, and it's pretty much anywhere that has some kind of ligaments or blood vessels or something passing through the body wall. For example, um, your umbilical cord, right? Um, back in the day, it used to connect to blood vessels on the inside of your abdomen, which ultimately delivered um, oxygenated blood to your heart and drained deoxygenated blood from the rest of your body. Um, and so, those vessels never fully disappear. In fact, um, they 
just turn into ligaments, right? And so um, those ligaments still pass through your abdominal wall. And so that's a weakness. Um, there is a weakness um, right here. Um, and so essentially, um, you know, we looked at nerves and we looked at blood vessels. Um, we have femoral nerves, femoral blood vessels, um, and they are going to pass through the body wall right about here. And so anytime you have, um, you know, that opening that's already existing, it's already supposed to be in your body wall, um, this is where hernia can develop. Um, also inguinal, right? So um, particularly in males, the, uh, the vas deferens actually passes from the testis up over the top of, um, of the pelvis to the back of the bladder, um, ultimately to deliver sperm um, to create semen. Um, and so that is yet another um, weakness within the body wall. Okay, and so essentially when you have a very large pressure building up within your abdomen, right? And this can, because, can be because, um, you know, for example, you are going through childbirth, right? So labor, lots and lots of pressure. Um, if you are constipated a lot and you're constantly pushing, trying to defecate, um, that's a lot of pressure in your abdomen. Um, stress, of course, um, can build up a lot of pressure within your body. Um, also, if you are lifting a lot of heavy things a lot, um, this can build up pressure and therefore um, just kind of like um, think about a button going through a buttonhole, right? So any organs on the inside with so much pressure, they have to have somewhere to go. And so they find these weaknesses and poke through. Okay. Um, and so that's a hernia. Um, why am I talking about hernias when we're talking about the greater momentum? Well, without the greater momentum, right? When your abdominal organs are starting to, uh, when you're forming a hernia, um, your abdominal organs would be just below the surface of your muscles, subcutaneous fat and skin. And so the intestines would actually protrude through these weaknesses. Okay. Um, and right, here's the hernia. Um, and this is problematic, of course, because food is coming along down the small intestine here. And it gets to this point, and this part of the intestine is kind of pinched off, right? So the food cannot proceed farther down the GI tract. There is no alternate route, right? There's no intestinal anastomoses. Instead, food is stopped and starts to back up, right? Therefore, increasing the pressure and the problems. So if you have a greater momentum, the first thing that's going to protrude in a hernia is just fat, right? No big deal, right? Obviously very painful and not ideal, but it's not going to cause these additional problems as well. Okay, so outermost layer of the tube is always this connective tissue for stabilization. That's what um, the serosa is in the GI tract. Deep to the serosa, we have the muscular layer. The muscular layer itself is made up of not one layer of tissue, but for the most part, two layers of tissue. Okay. One is longitudinal, so it goes along the length of the tube. The other is circular, so it goes around the tube. Okay. And so that between these two layers, we can produce both peristalsis and segmentation, right? and the two layers working together. Um, if we look closely at this diagram up here, we can see here is the circular layer, the cells are going around a circle here, longitudinal, is more superficial over here, okay? And so this tissue is made up of smooth muscle. Okay, remember there's three different types of muscle tissue, skeletal muscle, okay? So you know, the muscles that move our body, um, as well as the diaphragm, okay? There's cardiac muscle, which we talked about for exam one. And then finally there is smooth muscle. And so that is what um, is in the tunica media, right, of the blood vessels, okay, and that is what is in this layer, the muscularis externa of the GI tract, 
Okay, we can see the smooth muscle cells are kind of tapered on either side, and they're also connected to each other, um, ultimately facilitating the rapid transmission of action potentials from one cell to the next to the next. Okay, these layers, longitudinal and circular layers, are each composed of two or three different um, layers of smooth muscle cells. So here we can see multiple layers of cells, so it's not super thick, um, but also there's still a lot of strength in this layer. Um, again, they're connected by gap junctions. Okay, And the fact that these cells are electrically coupled together means that they are functioning as a single unit. Okay, um, So it's not just individual cells contracting like in the skeletal muscles, it is all of them in a particular area contracting all together. Um, and so this also produces this wave-like contraction pattern, therefore giving rise to peristalsis. Okay. Most of these cells are never actually interacting with a neuron at all. Okay. Um, they're just receiving a message from nearby cells. Okay. In order to stimulate a contraction, in the smooth muscle, the digestive system um, uses something similar to the cardiac muscle, um, and that is they use pace setter step cells. Okay, so you can think about the SA node, the AV node, and all the other uh, pacemaker cells and nodes of the heart. Essentially, these cells, these pace setter cells, are programmed to automatically depolarize within a certain time frame. It is certainly not as fast as the SA node, but um, we still get this automatic contraction. So this makes sure that no matter what's happening, no matter what your brain is doing, no matter what the nervous system of the gut is doing, you're always going to have a certain amount of motility or movement within your digestive tract. Now, these cells, pace setter cells, um, can be kind of nudged by the central nervous system. Okay. Um, so again, just like we saw in the heart, the SA node is kind of depolarizing at a pretty regular rate. Okay. Um, but the SNS can ramp up that depolarization. It can accelerate it and therefore the heart beats a lot faster. Okay. The autonomic nervous system is also able to act on these pace setter cells. Okay. Um, and that is um, stimulated Right? These are stimulated or accelerated by not the sympathetic division, but the parasympathetic division. Remember that the rest and digest system is parasympathetic. And so all of this digestive activity is actually ramped up by the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, so again, the vagus nerve, as we've talked about before, is going to control about 75% of the parasympathetic um, control over the body. And so the vagus nerve enhances whatever is going on in the DI tract. Okay. Finally, the speed of contractions and the forcefulness of contractions within this smooth or these smooth muscle layers are also regulated by various local factors. So we're going to see um, a lot of those hormones that are released by the, uh, the digestive digestive tract can also increase um, or decrease the contractions, the contractility, the speed of these pace setter cell depolarizations. I mentioned that the digestive system has its own nervous system. Okay, this is actually the third division of the autonomic nervous system called the enteric nervous system. Um, part of that division of the nervous system, the enteric, um, is sandwiched in between the two layers of the muscularis externa. As we can see here, here's the serosa, connective tissue on the outside, longitudinal muscle and circular muscles of the muscularis externa. Wedged in between those layers, we have all of these little yellow guys sticking out. That's nervous tissue. Okay, so those are nerves. Um, essentially, we have this network of nerves 
um, a plexus, right? So we have a brachial plexus, we have a lumbar plexus, etc. Here we have a myenteric plexus. Okay, so my always indicates muscle, enteric is something to do with the gut. Okay, so this is the gut muscle plexus. Okay, the fact that it is wedged in between these two layers indicates that it's going to be controlling these two layers. So if you want to uh, increase or decrease the peristalsis and segmentation produced by the muscular external layers, you should control that via the myenteric plexus. Okay, so a little bit more about that. Um, the enteric nervous system, again, a division of the autonomic nervous system, um, enacts local control over these two layers via the myenteric plexus. Remember that the um, sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions are able to not micromanage what's going on at this level, but they are there to kind of override what um, the myenteric plexus is already doing. So if you want to decrease um, peristalsis and segmentation, so motility movement within the digestive tract, sympathetic neurons should release norepinephrine onto these neurons right here. Okay? If you want to enhance digestive activity, then parasympathetic neurons of the vagus nerve are going to release acetylcholine onto the myenteric plexus as well. Okay, so um, the digestive tract is just kind of doing its own thing. It's automatically programmed to move at a certain rate, but we can slam on the gas or on the brakes, depending on the needs of the entire body. And so I think you, uh, hopefully at this point, you should be seeing that that's a theme. Most of our organs just kind of do their own thing, but then the central control mechanisms, right? The brain, the endocrine system can override or at least modify whatever's going on at the organ level. Okay. The next layer down is the submucosa. Um, the submucosa, Right, next deepest layer is made up of dense irregular connective tissue. So essentially just making a really strong layer, strong structure for joining together the muscular layer with the mucosa itself. And so that's where we're getting. Um, in the submucosa, this is where we have the blood and lymphatic vessels. So all of these capillary beds right, receive blood and are drained of blood via these arteries and veins housed within the submucosa. We also see another color here. The green is showing us lymphatic vessels. So we're gonna learn about that um, next week, the week after. So really soon we're talking about the lymphatic system. Okay. Also some glands, right, really big mucous glands are embedded within the submucosa. So all this gray again is the submucosa. There's another plexus, okay? another network of nerves that is controlling something completely on its own, but can be modified by central control mechanisms, so the nervous and endocrine systems, as well as some other local hormonal factors. Okay? This plexus is called the submucosal plexus, right? because it's within the submucosal layer. Um, the proximity of this plexus to things like glands should indicate that um, this plexus is controlling secretions of the digestive system. Right? So my enteric, my means muscle, so this is controlling motility, movement. The submucosa is controlling mucus secretion. It is controlling hormone or acid secretion by the mucus layer as well as these extra glands. Okay, um, I also want to point out that there is a layer of muscle tissue right here, and I'm going to talk about that on the next slide. Um, this layer of muscle tissue is also controlled by the adjacent submucosal plexus, okay. which leads us all the way to the lining of the GI tract. Okay. The lining of the GI tract is called the mucosa. Just like we've seen before, this is an epithelial layer that essentially is secreting lots of mucus. The digestive tract 
very much needs a lot of mucus so that um, there is ample lu lubrication for moving along feces. Okay. Um, the mucosa contains this other layer of muscle tissue called the muscularis mucosi. All right, so muscularis, something to do with the muscle. Mucosi, it's a muscle of the mucosa layer. Um, so the, uh, this layer is right here. And so when this muscle contracts, it's essentially going to squeeze all of these other little purple glands. When the glands are squeezed, they're going to secrete whatever their um, secretion is out onto the surface of the lumen here. Okay, so submucosal plexus can increase secretions by triggering contraction of the muscularis mucosa. Okay. Another thing that, that the mucosa contains is a lot of lymphatic tissue. Okay, so uh, again, we're gonna talk about this in more detail later, but there are a series of little follicles, okay? Um, little bunches of tissue, um, particular condition, uh, tissue that houses various white blood cells. Okay, so these little patches of lymphatic tissue are just beneath this lining. And so the idea here is that if anything doesn't belong um, in our body, right, kind of, you know, bacteria, fungus, whatever that um, is pathogenic, if this stuff happens to get past our epithelial lining, right, immediately deep to that lining, as we see here, so if something is out here and crosses over this layer, the blood is right there. Okay, so pathogens can jump into the blood and therefore be circulated throughout the body and then infect the entire body. Obviously, that's not ideal. So we put these little patches just deep to this tissue, hopefully catching anything that crosses over that membrane that doesn't belong. Um, this can also be uh, non-digested food. Okay, uh, so uh, if you have a leaky gut, right, and food particles get from here across this membrane, that's not supposed to be in your body like that, right? It's not, it's not supposed to be there. And so your um, immune system in these little follicles is essentially going to snatch up anything that doesn't look quite right and launch an immune response against it, okay? Collectively, these little follicles are called MALT, mucosal associated lymphatic tissue. And we'll talk more about that in the lymphatic section. Okay. Finally, we've got the epithelium, right? The mucosa, of course, has epithelial tissue. This is the barrier between inside the body and outside the body. Um, the cells are joined together by these specialized cell junctions so that in order to absorb something or allow it to cross over the epithelium, those things have to go through the cells, right? Those cells are really selective about what they allow to pass. The epithelial layer, the mucosa, is constantly moistened by glandular secretions. Again, we need a lot of lubrication to allow digesting food to be propelled along the GI tract. Okay. The epithelium itself changes over the course of the GI tract, um, essentially where it is closest to the outside world and is more likely to get um, or to experience abrasion by, for example, what you're eating. Um, we essentially line those structures with um, a relatively thick epithelium of very cheaply made cells. Okay, so I mentioned this a little bit before, but in your oral cavity, as well as in um, your oro and laryngopharynx, and also in your esophagus, all of these things are being exposed to your Doritos, right? So when you chew those Doritos up and you swallow them, they're gonna be scratching down the, the lining, the mucosa of that part of your GI tract. And so the oral cavity all the way through the esophagus is lined by stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Okay, so when your Doritos scrape off a couple layers, no big deal, there's still plenty more. And of course, we're not in just investing a ton of energy into making them, making those cells because they're just flat, you know, kind of cheaply made. Um, 
from your stomach through the end of your long and large intestine, the mucosa is made of simple columnar epithelial tissue. Um, so the columnar part should imply that these cells are capable of secreting stuff, right? A lot of stuff. Um, there is a lot of volume in these cells for different types of organelles, right? And those organelles are constantly cranking out enzymes or buffers or whatever their job is. Okay. The fact that it is a simple epithelium should imply that we want this barrier between in our body and the outside world, that is whatever is in the GI tract, to be as thin as possible. Right? Just like with the respiratory system, we try to minimize this barrier for the ease of diffusion, right? for efficient diffusion from outside, that is in the alveolus or in the small intestine, for example, and the adjacent blood vessels. Um, <clears throat> oft, or particularly in certain parts of the GI tract, as we're going to see, um, there are specialized modifications in the mucosa to increase surface area. Um, one of these adaptations, one of these structures is a villus or villi for plural. Um, if we look closely here, we can see that the small intestine mucosa isn't smooth. Okay, all of these tiny little things here, each one of those is called a villus or again, villi for plural. Um, and so this is greatly increasing the surface area for secretion and absorption. We also see this larger structure right here. Of course, it is covered with villi, right? but this bigger wave in the lining is called a circular fold or a plique circularis. Um, and essentially, this is a fold within the entire lining um, that isn't just like a ring in the lining. It, it's more like a screw. Right, so like a corkscrew. Um, and the idea here is that as food is being pushed down the tube right, via peristalsis, it's not going in a straight line. It is being churned, right, kind of like clothes in a dryer, right, like all mixing together with one another. Um, and so the circular folds are allowing that to happen. Right. Um, we're gonna zoom in on these here in just a moment as well. There's even more surface area um, that's formed, okay? Um, this image is just for your own benefit. It's another way of looking at that, all those same structures, but um, in a little bit of a different form. So I encourage you to compare these different structures. Okay. This image um, is very simplified image of the alimentary canal. And I like this because it really breaks down each individual part and what exactly it is doing. And so my suggestion to you guys is to use this um, as kind of a, a launching off point. Um, think about what's happening in the oral cavity, right? In general, this is where we begin with mechanical digestion. As we're going to see soon, even chemical digestion is going to start here, but only the carbohydrates and the fats are going to be digested chemically in the oral cavity. Okay, Following the pathway of the food all the way on down, food is swallowed, goes through the esophagus, enters into the stomach. In the stomach, we have mechanical digestion occurring, so essentially churning food with stomach acid. Okay. We have chemical digestion of proteins and fats. Right? So no more carb digestion, just proteins and fats. Um, that'll be important. Um, we also get a teeny bit of absorption. Okay, and so just a little bit, right? The majority of absorption is happening later, but certain tiny lipid soluble substances are actually able to cross over the lining of the stomach and enter into the blood. Um, and these are only things like alcohol and aspirin, not proteins, fats, etc. Okay. Food is then going to pass into the small intestine. And in the small intestine, we get a little bit more mechanical digestion, but the big function of this very long organ is chemical digestion. In fact, this is where the overwhelming majority of chemical digestion is going to occur. 
This is the only place where all four categories of biomolecule are able to be broken down. Okay, and of course, it's not even by intestinal enzymes, it is by pancreatic enzymes. Okay, so lots and lots of digestion occurring in the small intestine, also lots and lots of absorption of those digested molecules. So um, this is the place for absorption of all four classes of biomolecules. We're absorbing lots of water, we're absorbing vitamins and minerals. Okay, so lots of absorption, lots of digestion. The small intestine is like the big piece of this puzzle. Okay. Finally, whatever is left over after the small intestine is done um, is going to be passed in the large intestine. Um, there's a little bit more mechanical digestion, but at this point, we aren't breaking down these biomolecules for our own purposes anymore. We are not physically breaking them or chemically breaking them down. Whatever we got out of our food in the small intestine, that's all we're gonna get, okay? Um, there is, however, a teeny bit more digestion occurring, and this is solely for, or solely by the bacteria and for the bacteria of our large intestine. All right, so you gotta eat your fiber, you gotta feed the bacteria in your gut. Um, the bacteria in your large intestine need to eat to take care of the rest of the GI tract. All right, we'll talk about that more um, later. Um, okay, the other function of the large intestine, if we're not absorbing biomolecules and we're not um, really breaking them down much anymore either, is the absorption of water. Right, the compaction of the food. Um, we absorb ions and water and minerals, and vitamins. We're not getting any more sugar, for example. Okay, so again, this is very simplified, very helpful. If you can expand on all of these things and talk about chemical digestion in the small intestine, if you can talk about absorption in the small intestine, if you can talk about, you know, mechanical and chemical, chemical digestion in the stomach, like you're good to go, right? This is a really good um, simplified diagram. So let's jump in a little bit more deeply into these different regions and what's happening in them. Um, we're gonna start in the oral cavity and follow it all the way down like we usually do. Okay. The teeth. Okay, are accessory organs um, of the digestive system. Okay, so they're not actually chemically digesting anything, but they do help us to um, take big stuff and kind of shear it off into smaller molecules. Another accessory organ of the oral cavity are the salivary glands. We have two different types of salivary glands. The first are intrinsic salivary glands. These are the ones that are um, kind of embedded within the epithelium, they are always um, secreting a certain volume of saliva into your oral cavity. And essentially this is kind of like bathing over your teeth, allowing you to kind of cleanse your oral cavity, pick up any debris and swallow it, um, getting it out of your mouth, of course. Um, it's also, um, sorry, uh, it's also uh, creating, uh, you know, enough moisture so that you can talk, right? Talking about the super dry mouth is very difficult. So the intrinsic salivary glands are constantly moistening inside your mouth. The other type of salivary glands are the extrinsic salivary glands. And these um, are named, right? Three different pairs of extrinsic salivary glands. We have the parotid salivary glands, right? Which is pretty much right back here in your jaw. Um, we have the submandibular glands, okay, so your mandible would be right here, so the, uh, these guys are like way under here, um, and the sublingual glands, um, these are right under your tongue, um, and so maybe you've experienced this before, but um, sometimes, um, you know, when you lift your tongue, there's like this little squirt of saliva um, from underneath your tongue, and so that is just the sublingual glands releasing some saliva. Right, and oftentimes this will happen when you're thinking about food or you smell food or you know, anything, food. Okay. 
what's in the saliva, right? Of course, intrinsic gland saliva uh, is, uh, <laughs> oh, sorry, um, is mostly water, okay? Extrinsic gland saliva is also mostly water, but it contains some other stuff as well. Um, sorry, this, uh, the animations are a little bit wonky on this. So let me take a step back here, sorry. Um, extrinsic gland saliva is only secreted when you are doing something that has to do with food. And so this is tasting food. This is um, feeling food in your mouth. As we're going to see, this is even thinking about food. It is smelling food, um, anything to do with food. Um, and so when you think about food, right, which you might be doing right now that I'm talking about it, um, when you think about food, um, your brain stem is going to send impulses along parasympathetic fibers and two cranial nerves to stimulate the release of these of this particular type of saliva. Um, sympathetic stimulation, on the other hand, is going to inhibit anything to do with the digestive system. And so um, if you are experiencing a fight or flight response, you might notice that your mouth is a little bit dry. Okay? This saliva, again, as I was saying, is mostly water, but it also contains electrolytes. Yeah, a lot of different ions. It contains mucin. It contains metabolic wastes. All right, and this might be a little bit weird to think about, but um, your body's metabolism is constantly producing urea and uric acid from the breakdown of biomolecules. And we try to get rid of that in any way that we possibly can. Of course, urea and uric acid are released in the urine. We know that, we can appreciate that, but it's also released in your sweat glands and it's released in your saliva as well. Um, this particular type of saliva is also really important in your immune response. Um, your oral cavity, of course, is open to the outside world and it is a point of vulnerability. And so if um, a pathogen is going to enter into your body, chances are it's going to be through your nose or your mouth. And so our saliva contains a lot of different types of defense mechanisms against any kind of microorganisms. Lysozyme is a protein that is antimicrobial. Um, so our defenses and cyanide actually um, protects us against different types of microorganisms. And here we see a type of antibody. Um, this is immunoglobulin A. It is a particular shape of antibody um, that is produced after you have been exposed to something in particular. So these, um, as we're going to see, binds very specifically and tightly to one particular type of antigen, right? Hopefully sounding familiar after we talked about the blood. Um, they bind those antigens together and therefore um, the organism is able to be um, attacked or dealt with by the immune system because it's no longer mobile because it's bound up by these antibodies. Okay, so antibodies, as I said before, never attack anything. They're never killing anything, but they do bind to stuff that um, they're programmed to see. Okay, so take a message here. The saliva is filled with all sorts of stuff to keep you healthy, keep bad stuff out. Okay. And as I said, the extrinsic gland saliva is released only when you are thinking about or eating food. Okay. Therefore, it's linked to those events because this type of saliva and only this type of saliva contains enzymes. Okay. These digestive enzymes specifically digest starch and they digest lipids. And right. so on that nice simple diagram I showed you, I told you that um, carbohydrates and lipids are digested chemically within the oral cavity because of these enzymes. And so here we see salivary amylase. So this is in the saliva only. Okay, so the pH of the mouth um, 
the temperature of the mouth, right? All these things makes or are an ideal environment for the function of amylase. Okay, ACE enzyme, amyl, so amylose starch is digested by amylase in the slide. Okay, lingual lipase, ACE enzyme, lip, lipid, lingual, right? So if you are bilingual, you have two tongues, you have two languages. Okay, so lingua is tongue. Lingual lipase is released on the tongue by these extrinsic salivary glands, and this enzyme digests lipids. Okay, so um, in this section of the course, I'm going to throw a lot of different words, a lot of different things at you. Um, you know, different types of amylase, different types of lipases, all these different types of enzymes and hormones, and all sorts of molecules. I recommend trying to break them down, right? Always try to break these things down. Look for the clues, right? If you see this in a multiple choice question, you can break it down, you know where it is and you know what it does, right? Just by using these context clues. After the oral cavity, right? just like we watched before with this video, um, the bolus of food, is propelled to the back of the mouth, right? The epiglottis swings down, okay? Bolus passes through the first esophageal sphincter. Peristalsis propels the bolus all the way down and into the stomach, okay? Through what is called the lower esophageal sphincter, okay? Um, as I mentioned, these, uh, these circular muscles um, may be familiar to you because of their, because they're, um, acid reflux commercials um, that show how the sphincters don't snap shut all the way in these individuals. And what that does is it allows stomach acid to kind of bubble up and damage the lining of, um, of your esophagus, right? So yes, there are lots of different squamous layers, but that's not enough to completely protect this tube. Okay, so we really don't want stomach acid or any of the stomach contents to come up. So we have a, one sphincter here and another sphincter here. Um, that is a good note, actually. Um, sphincters, super important. We're going to talk about a lot of them this term or in this section specifically. Anytime I'm talking about a circular muscle, I'm talking about a sphincter. Um, when we see these little like ovals on either side of a tube, think that you know, the tube is like this, and essentially the muscle is going around that tube. And so when we take a section through it, that looks like just these little two ovals on either side. Okay, um, so that is a muscle that is kind of coming out of the screen on us and then wrapping back around, going all the way around this tube. And essentially sphincters are there to control the flow of substances from one area to the next, right? We only want food to flow down and not up. Okay. And we'll see more sphincters as we go along. Okay. The esophagus is going to kind of dump off the bolus into the stomach via a structure called the cardiac orifice. And we already saw this, so we're just gonna skip over that. Okay. Um, let me introduce you to the anatomy of the stomach. Now, the stomach has this curved shape. Okay, here is the cardiac orifice, okay, where the esophagus dumps the bolus in. Um, the stomach then kind of curves to the left, right? patient's left, not yours. Um, on one side of the stomach, this is called the greater curvature, right? nice and big and larger. And so on the inner side, on the right side, this is the lesser curvature. Okay, note that this isn't just a pure like J shape. Instead, the superior most portion of the stomach kind of domes up a little bit. And so this dome here is called the fundus. Okay, as we're going to see, the fundus contains stretch receptors. Um, which are essentially detecting whether or not the stomach is full or not. Okay, so if you have so much food in your stomach that even the fundus is going to stretch, you're full, right? You have had enough to eat, okay? 
couple modifications to the wall itself. Okay. The muscularis externa has not two layers, right? Not just a longitudinal and a circular layer, but also an oblique layer. Okay, so here we can see one, two, and three different layers. Instead of simply peristalsis and segmentation moving food along, the stomach is also designed to be a storage organ. Okay, so we eat a big meal, and a lot of that meal is going to hang out in your stomach for the next couple hours as just teeny little bits are going to flow back down into the small intestine. Right? We can't just dump the whole contents of the stomach and the small intestine at once we need to slowly introduce the food onto the small intestine. So the stomach is storing the food and it's processing, it's digesting that food the entire time. Uh, and so instead of just squeezing it down, it's going to churn the food, right? So the extra layer allows this mixing motion, putting stomach acids and enzymes and all sorts of other things together with the ingested food. To modify this, or to elaborate on this rather, um, the muscularis externa has these three layers of smooth muscle. All right, this is the mucosa layer, the submucosa here, uh, or sorry, here, um, and one, two, and three layers of the stomach wall. Um, unfortunately, we can't watch this video here, but this was essentially um, showing the a video from inside the stomach during digestion. Um, so at this point we make cameras so darn tiny that we can put them in a little pill, swallow them and actually see what's going on in the stomach. Um, and it was a really cool video. Maybe you can find one that's similar, um, but essentially you can see the churning and the mixing. Okay. Another way that the stomach is different than the rest of the GI tract is that it has a highly modified mucosa layer. As I said, the stomach is a storage organ in addition to a digestive organ. And so sometimes your stomach is pretty empty, right? Between meals um, or when you wake up in the morning. And other times you just went to the buffet and you had a ton of food, right? So your stomach is nice and full, okay? The stomach can, contains these little folds in, the lining, right? The mucosal layer it has all these funny little folds, not like circular folds, but different folds that essentially allow the stomach to expand to three times its normal size after you've eaten a meal. Okay. Um, and over time, like depending on your lifestyle, your stomach can stretch even more than that, right? And even when it's completely like deflated, it's still much larger than an individual stomach that doesn't eat that much at one time, okay? Um, so these little folds here are called rugae um, and they allow for the stomach to expand. Oops, sorry. Um, the, I, I wanted to briefly mention a procedure um, that is done to facilitate weight loss, and that is called a Ruin Y gastric, bi excuse me, gastric bypass. Um, essentially, individuals who are struggling with obesity and fit certain qualifications um, can have surgical modifications conducted on their stomach and their intestines. Um, and so the um, one of the first things uh, that's done, one of the big things that's done is that the stomach um, is surgically separated, right? And essentially um, where the esophagus dumps the food into the cardiac orifice is much smaller, right? And so physically this tiny little portion of the stomach can't physically expand as much as the entire stomach here. Okay. Um, the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the specific portion of the stomach that is saved includes part of the fundus. Now, remember I said that the fundus is this dome shape up here. It is equipped with stretch receptors, right? Essentially when these stretch receptors, um, 
are activated. So when they're stretched, that is going to initiate a response, a hormonal response that essentially tells your brain, whoa, I am good to go. I am super full. Um, in the gastric bypass, those stretch receptors are still included here. And so um, the essentially message to your brain that you're full is going to happen much sooner, right? You don't have to fill up this entire stomach worth of food before your brain knows it's full. Um, instead, it's gonna know that it's full pretty much right away. Okay, so um, we'll talk more about what that um, mechanism is uh, in a later lecture. Okay, the other thing that's going to happen here is that um, the jejunum, right? So part of the small intestine, we're getting there. Um, the jejunum is going to be sewn to that much smaller pouch of the stomach now. Um, oftentimes, a lot of um, the length of the intestine is also removed in this process. So it's not just like we're going to clip this here and sew it up here. Instead, um, you know, a foot or more is actually removed from the small intestine. Um, so what that is doing is it is reducing the time and surface area for the digestion of food. So yes, maybe you ate a big meal, but you're having less time, less space to actually break those molecules down and um, you know, less time, less space to break the molecules down. And therefore you're not actually able to absorb quite as much um, of those calories. Okay. Um, as we're going to see, um, a lot of well, the digestive enzymes and the bile and all those things that we talked about in the previous lesson, those are dumped into the duodenum right about here, right? That hepatopancreatic ampulla through the major duodenal papilla. Okay, that's happening right here. And so once again, you're having less time, less space for the digestion of the food and therefore for the absorption of those calories. Okay. The duodenum, of course, is still going to be attached to the, to the jejunum right here. So you're still getting bile, you're still getting those enzymes, but with less time to actually do, um, to serve the purpose. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, you know, this surgery is, you know, kind of an interesting way to, uh, utilize the mechanisms already intrinsic to the stomach um, for rapid um, and abundant weight loss. Okay, uh, another way that the stomach's mucosal layer is different than the mucosa in the rest of the GI tract is that um, this mucosa secretes a ton of very alkaline mucus. Okay, or relatively alkaline mucus. Um, so what we can see here is the stomach lumen. So this is where all the food is, okay? Um, the pH of the lumen is really acidic, right? So this is very um, unpleasant and breaks down your cells very quickly. Um, here's the mucosa layer, and then here are the blood vessels within the submucosa, okay? We can't let this acid burn through these cells and get to our blood. Um, not good. So what we do is the mucosa cells are going to be secreting bicarbonate, right? That major buffer that we find in our blood, right? That we find um, the respiratory system using to balance the pH of our body. We secrete tons of bicarbonate into the mucus. Um, and so this um, layer, you know, relatively thick layer, physically serves or serves as a physical barrier between the stomach lining and the stomach acid. Um, it's not a perfect system though. Um, in fact, we are continually replacing the lining of our stomach once or twice a week. And because um, even though this layer is here, there's still a lot of damage to the cells underneath it. Okay, so that's kind of just the surface of the mucosa. Um, within the stomach only, the mucosa actually dips down, right, it invaginates into these pits, right, so this is a gastric pit, which open up into gastric 
glands. Right? The glands are going to be secreting all sorts of different things. Okay. Um, first of all, up here in the pit itself, so the essentially neck of the gland, this is, um, or some of the cells lining this neck or this pit are called mucous neck cells. And so they're constantly secreting this watery solution that's going to give rise or that's going to um, kind of deliver your gastric juices. And the gastric juices is essentially the stomach acid uh, and a variety of other things produced by the gland itself. Okay, so this is producing stuff which is being delivered via fluid secreted by the mucous neck cells and out into the lumen. Okay. In the gastric gland itself, we have three different types of cells. We have parietal cells, so wall cells, chief cells, and G cells or enteroendocrine cells. All right, so anatomy, why name something once? Um, entero, all right, so something to do with the gut, endocrine. So these cells, the G cells, are actually responsible for producing um, hormones, okay? The G cells are going to release their hormones into the blood, so they're going to release them out in this direction. The chief and parietal cells are going to release their contents that we're talking about in a moment into the gland itself, mixed with the mucus, and out into the lumen. And before I move to the next slide, I want to show you um, an actual pictomicrograph of the lining of the stomach. So each one of these little holes here is actually the opening into a gastric pit. Okay. The parietal cells, what do they do? The parietal cells are going to release stomach acid. Okay. Now this stomach acid, hydrochloric acid, isn't released as acid. Okay. This, um, or And the reason for that is that if you just made acid inside the cell, it would eat away at the cell. And of course, that's not ideal. We don't want to digest our cells and we don't want to burn our cells with acid. And so the parietal cells essentially take hydrogen out of water, right? And they are going to release it into the pit and then ultimately into the lumen. Okay. Also, chloride, is going to be taken and released separately as well. Um, and so I also want to point out that um, this same reaction is what we talked about in internal and external respiration, right? CO2 joins with water via carbonic anhydrase. Ultimately, this forms bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. Hydrogen is part of HCl. The bicarbonate is used as a buffer, and so that's going to help um, protect the stomach and buffer, right? Uh, buffer the blood. We also talked about this chloride shift. So bicarbonate goes out of the cell and because it's negatively charged, we need to replace it with another anion. Okay. And so here chloride is going to be exchanged and chloride is also used to make hydrochloric acid. All right. So the same kind of basic reactions, the same basic processes are happening in the respiratory and the digestive system. Okay. Um, of course, the release of this anion is going to leave a positive charge in the cell. So we also need to move some potassium around as well. Okay, it's beyond the scope of what you need to know. Okay. Stomach acid, why do we even need it in the first place? Well, stomach acid is going to, um, first of all, denature our proteins in our food. Okay, so um, remember that proteins really like a particular pH. Okay, so when we ingest them, they go into our stomach and they start to unravel. Okay, this is opening up the protein so that more enzymes can latch on to those amino acids and start breaking them off the protein. Okay, so we denature our protein. This is a type of mechanical digestion. Um, the pH is going to activate a type of zymogen. And we'll talk about the zymogen name in just a moment, but essentially the active form of a protease in the stomach is called pepsin. Okay, so HCl activates um, a protease into active, or yeah, activates a zymogen into the active protease pepsin. Okay, so this assures that pepsin doesn't break down our cells, it's only turned on 
in the lumen of the stomach. Okay, and finally, the stomach acid is really important in sterilizing the food that we eat. Okay, so it kills the bacteria that we happen to take in um, in our food. Okay, so bacteria also like a particular type of pH, and it's probably not the pH of stomach acid. Okay, so sterilization, mechanical digestion in terms of denaturing proteins, and activating protease enzymes. Okay, the second thing that parietal cells do is that they release intrinsic factor. Right? We talked about this in the very beginning of class together. Intrinsic factor is secreted by the parietal cells. Um, and it is important because we absolutely need intrinsic factor to absorb vitamin B12 in small intestine. If we don't have intrinsic factor, we can't take B12 into our body, right, across the mucosa, into our blood, and therefore we can't make red blood cells. It's so very important um, to have intrinsic factor. Finally, the chief cells, their job within the gastric pit slash gastric glands is to release that zymogen, right? To release pepsinogen into the lumen. Of course, we don't want pepsinogen to break down the chief cells themselves. And so it is only turned on by hydrochloric acid. And so pepsinogen is released. It's activated into pepsin, pepsin can then go forth and start breaking proteins into individual amino acids. Okay. The chief cells also secrete another type of enzyme, a gastric lipase. Okay. Before we talked about lingual lipase, lingual tongue must be in the oral cavity. Here we have gastric lipase, gastric stomach. This must be a lipase, a lipid digesting enzyme that is present and active within the stomach. Okay. This enzyme is going to take triglycerides, okay. so this is a glycerol, and this is, or these are individual fatty acids, and it's essentially going to break those fatty acids off so that later in the small intestine we can actually absorb them. The final type of cell in these gastric glands are those enteroendocrine cells. Again, these are secreting hormones. And so the hormones aren't going to do any good if they're released into the stomach lining itself in, or into the stomach lumen itself. Instead, these enteroendocrine cells are also called G cells, are releasing their hormones out into the blood. And so it's the opposite direction of all the others that we've been talking about so far. These uh, enteroendocrine cells release hormones that act at the local level. So these are called paracrine hormones, um, serotonin and histamine. We're not going to go into the details of those here. Um, but what will become really important for us are hormones that can control the entire digestive tract and even have some effects on the rest of the body. And these hormones are called gastrin and somatostatin. The fact that gastrin has gastro, that root in it, means that this has control over the stomach. And it's going to be very important. Um, and so this here um, is showing us, you know, the stomach. We can see that, um, you know, the vagus nerve has an impact or has control over different parts of the stomach. Okay, we can release acetylcholine and essentially activate um, or at least upregulate the function of different cells. And so if the vagus nerve um, releases acetylcholine onto the parietal cells, the parietal cells release more hydrogen, right? And they're also going to release more of that pepsinogen, and that's going to enhance the digestive activity of the stomach, okay? So rest and digest, this is enhancing the digest part. And the vagus nerve can also release acetylcholine onto the G cells or enteroendocrine cells. And that's going to trigger the G cells to release gastrin, not into the lumen. We don't wanna digest the hormone, but instead we want to release gastrin into the blood so it can talk to the parietal cells to further enhance the digestive activity of the stomach. And so we're gonna get into the hormones themselves in a bit. I just wanted to show you that um, kind of all of these things are working together. Okay. Uh, the, uh, so this chart is just a summary of all of the different types of cells that we just talked about. Remember that the mucus cells on the surface lining of, uh, of the stomach, those are secreting um, alkaline 
more or less alkaline uh, mucus to protect the lining of the stomach, but the neck mucus cells are secreting a mucus um, that is filled with all these other things. So it makes up the gastric juices. Okay, chief cells secrete pepsinogen, parietal cells secrete HCL, which activates pepsinogen into pepsin. Okay? Intrinsic factor also super important. Um, finally, G cells secrete gastrin, and gastrin does a ton of other things, which we will talk about soon. Um, when, um, so a clinical uh, imbalance here, so homeostatic, homeostatic imbalance, um, gastritis, so inflammation of stomach tissue. Um, so this is caused anytime something breaches that barrier. So anytime it goes past this mucus barrier and even, um, you know, through the epithelial cells and into the body down here. Um, of course, our body responds with the inflammatory process, and this can lead to um, more trouble. Um, peptic or gastric ulcers um, are when um, often H. pylori bacteria infect the stomach. Um, they cause this erosion here, and so um, without this protection, um, the stomach lining starts to degrade, right, and allows the stomach contents to leak um, out of the lumen of the stomach and into the body. So this is very uncomfortable um, and very dangerous, right? Um, a major risk factor for alter, ulcers um, is um, smoking, right? That's always um, a major risk factor for pretty much everything. Um, aspirin and other NSAID, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen, um, if you're taking them a lot, um, this can start to erode the lining of your stomach. Um, a lot of caffeine, unfortunately. Um, emotional and physical stress can also lead to ulcers. Um, and um, if you are um, taking, um, you know, a, a, other types of medications, um, this can also lead to erosion of the stomach lining. Okay. Um, all right, uh, I'm going to stop here because uh, I know that uh, the video has been long enough as it is, and I'll continue this in our next lesson together. Thank you so much for hanging in there um, and for watching this. I will see you in our next class. Thanks.